Good morning. Okay, all right. It's going to be that kind of day, is it? All right. I appreciate that. I mean, you don't, you don't have to go crazy or nothing. I mean, take it easy. Exactly. Take it easy. Take it easy. That's right. Um, talking about crooked sticks. Um, and I just love going through these stories in the Bible. Life stories are always interesting to me. Um, I grew up in this church. Uh, I actually, I uh, told the first service, my, uh, my two first memories from this, from this church are uh, being inside of a five-gallon bucket, falling asleep in that room over there. I'm not a tall man, and I was an even smaller boy. It's, it was last year. That's right. It's true. It's true. And uh, my parents couldn't find me for like 20 minutes. They were freaking out, as parents do, and then they found me under the bucket. Uh, She said asleep, I'm assuming uh, nearly asphyxiating from lack of oxygen. Um, Science, you know, we discover things. So in there, um, I remember falling asleep right over there in pews. They were nice and wood, because, you know, wood's soft. Um, Consequently, because of that, uh, I can sleep anywhere. Uh, because I learned to sleep in church. Am I the only one? By laughter, I'm assuming now. I think it's interesting. um, Let's go to the Wayback Machine. Ready? Let's go in the Wayback Machine. Let's remember what it was like to be a 15 or 16-year-old. For some of you, it might be a year. You might be 15 or 16. But for most of us in here, it looks like a beautiful crowd. What it was like to be a teenager, what it was like to be a youngin, a young adult, and to have this question, what are you going to be when you grow up? That's nerve-wracking. As a teenager, it's nerve-wracking. Let's be honest, as adults, it's nerve-wracking. Right? Like, you have these milestones, oh, you're 13 now, okay, you're an adult. And then, uh, oh, you're 18, and you can legally vote and buy cigarettes. Good job. Oh, don't forget, scratchers. And then uh, you turn uh, 25 and you can rent a car. (laughs) All right. You can look like you're rich for two days. And I think back to that time for me, and and, and it was a time of not only what do you want to do, but what do you want to be? Like those, those questions of purpose. What do I want to do with my life? Like, what kind of person do I want to be? What, what do I want to be? And you don't ask it that way when you're a teenager, but I think about that now. Like, what is my purpose? Why am I here? And, and, and I started searching for that, and I figured, okay, I'm going to do what every red-blooded American man does. I'm going to go to college. And I went. And while I was there, I felt completely and morally bankrupt inside. Because up until that point, that question of what do you want to do, what do you want to be, was always self-serving, self-seeking. Why should I think about anybody else? There's only me. I ain't got to worry about anybody else. And so when going into college and and going to college and thinking about the school and, okay, I'm going to go to a good school, going to get a good job, I'm going to start making money, and then I'm going to, and then you always do those caveats, and then I'm going to help people and I'm going to use that money for, for the kingdom. I grew up in church. I knew, the, I knew the vernacular. But I realized that my pursuits, and that pursuit at that point to get a degree, had kind of short-circuited what God had for me. And I remember standing right there, crying as a... 19 slash 20 year old feeling like I, God I need you to hit the reset button on my life God I need you I need you to do something here and that was rough and that was hard but I gotta tell you that was probably one of the best decisions because I looked I started looking beyond myself beyond what Josh needed or wanted I got needs I got desires and looking towards God I need something bigger to live for than just me. I need something bigger to live for than just money and 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 toys and 
and iPods. That didn't exist then. That was 96. It's been a while. And this issue of purpose was kind of came to a head because I went to Masses Commission. It's a ministry trade school. Uh, they used to be everywhere, and there was one in this church. And, and, and part of that is you come, you come to this building every single day, and you're going to Bible college courses, and, and, you're, um, and you're praying for an hour a day, and you're doing your 250 scripture memory verses. And yeah, we had to memorize 250 scriptures uh, to graduate from each year. And that was rough. And the first one I memorized was Jesus wept because I'm not an idiot. Boom, one down. <laughs> Jesus wept. You're welcome. And in this time, there's something about when, when you're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start serving him in every single day of my life. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be great. And you're like, God, I want to see angels with my eyes. I want to I wanna audibly hear your voice. You start praying those things, right? Like, like I want supernatural things to happen around me. I want to see miracles. I want to see cheeseburgers where there were no cheeseburgers. <laughs> it's modern day. Fish and loaves, come on. Lord Jesus, put a hedge of protect, protection around my pancreas. You know, that kind of stuff. So... I think one of the stories from that time in my life uh, kind of encapsulates kind of where I was and where a lot of us were in Masses Commission. And there was a, a young lady who was praying to, to audibly hear God's voice. She wanted to see God. God, I want to I wanna see with my eyes. I don't want to just like kind of experience you on the side. I want to know that I've physically seen you with my eyes. I want to hear you. I want to hear the audible voice of the Lord with my ears and my face. So she's praying for an hour. God, I want to see you. God, I want to see you. God, I want to hear you. I want to, I want to see angels. I want to see the supernatural. She's going off. Prayer ends. Nothing happened, but she gets like this feeling in her stomach. And you know sometimes, like right there, that's him. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Come on, it's the elephant in the room. We all heard it. It's okay. She gets this feeling in her stomach, like, and you, you know, like when you're, when you're, you just know something's going to happen, right? Just it's that, that sixth sense, whatever. It's, it's that Holy Spirit inside of you, something's going to happen, ah! and you're just waiting. So she gets up and she starts walking. She's walking down the hallway and there's, she's about to turn the corner and she hears footsteps and her stomach goes, <laughs> She's like, oh no, it's happening. And footsteps are coming, coming, coming. All of a sudden, she sees a figure turn the corner and she's like, oh! <laughs> and it's her friend. And at that moment, she hears God tell her, you want to see the supernatural and angels, but you can't even handle seeing your friend. I think a lot of times, we, as human beings, want to see these amazing works of God. And hey, I want to sing to you. I'm not dis discounting that at all. But we totally forget that sometimes God works in the background. God works in the normal. God works in the mundane. Not that he doesn't do that. Because I've been in those experiences where we've prayed for somebody and they receive sight. It's the nuttiest thing. You're like, you were blind and now you're not. I don't know what to do with that information. Can we go get some tacos? I need to, I need to figure this out. Is the paleta man near? I need a paleta. Do you hear the bells? Ding, 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 ding. We want these supernatural experiences. You look at our television. This isn't just a Christian thing. Look at our television. What's one of the longest running television shows right now? Supernatural. God friended me. What's, what's the biggest uh, franchise right now of movies? Marvel. Super beings doing supernatural things around us regular humans. I want to fly around. I want to I do that right there and then start swinging. Although there's not many, I guess it'd be from trees in Grand Junction. There's not many tall buildings to do that to. But here's the thing, God working in the background, God working in the normal, in the mundane, that's in scripture as well. 
Because today we're going to be talking about Esther, God's diva. God's diva. In the book of Esther, it's interesting, never mentions the name of God once. Once. But it's in Scripture. That doesn't make any sense. There should be some angel coming down saying, okay, Esther, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, go do it. But there's no expectation of that, and it's just a regular person getting put into some crazy circumstances and then all of a sudden realizing, hey, maybe God's doing something here. And there's no burning bush, there's no Moses moment. It's the normal. It's the mundane. It shows us something very powerful. God orchestrating something amazing in the background. So Esther. Esther Esther's actual name is Hadassah. But that doesn't have the same ring to it, right? Esther sounds cooler. And Esther actually means star. Uh, I told them for service. I guess baby girl was not was a, you know, already taken. Baby girl. She's a hottie. She's pretty. I like her a lot. <laughs> right? She's a beautiful girl that grows up to be a beautiful woman. And she knows it. I mean, come on. Her nickname is Star. Like, you're going to do great things. You're beautiful. You're amazing. You hear that long enough, you start to believe it. Yeah. Guess I am. I'm a star. I'm good looking. I know what I'm doing. And we have this all set up. And that we have this diva, this girl that knows that she's pretty. And we have this story. It starts in Esther 1.1. Background. So there's this king and queen. And there's this long 180, 100 degrees, 180 days of just parades and, and, and celebrations. And all of a sudden, at the end of this 180 days, the entire city shuts down to have a seven-day kegger. You think I'm joking? Read it. Read it for yourself. It literally says there's, you can drink to excess. There's no limit to what you can drink. Figure out what will kill you and then back it off a little. And that's how much you drink each day. That's right, back it off only just a little bit. This huge razor, it's the end of the seven days. They're all having a good time. And at this point, there's the king and all his generals and princes, and they're all chilling at their party, and the queen is chilling at her party with all the women who are married to these guys. And, and you know what? The king, king's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> Y'all need to see how good looking my wife Vashti is. It's going to be great. You know what? Maybe I'll have her do a little dance for you. A little dance. So you know what's mine. <laughs> Sends the servants over there. and You gotta wonder what that exchange was. Hey, uh, the king would really like it if you would uh, go and you know, you put on your nice robes and look pretty and, and, and you know, and, and you know, parade yourself in front of the men and so the, everybody will know how blessed the king is because he has this beautiful wife. Is he drunk? <laughs> Why, yes. Yes, he is. And like any normal human being, I ain't going. You know what? No. I'm not going. You tell him I had something else to do. I was, you know, I was combing my hair and I couldn't come. Servants come back and they tell him, uh, she said no, she's not coming. There's nothing you can do or say about it. And he's drunk. And he's in front of all his friends, and there's a perception he has to maintain. And he, uh, what is commonly known uh, by kids today, is freaking out. You're going to disrespect me in front of my friends? You're going to disrespect me in front of my friends? He doesn't know what to do. He calls his advisors over. What, 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 sh what should I do here? And the advisors, man, they're awesome too, because they're like, you know what, here's the problem, king. Uh, if she disrespects you and doesn't do what you tell her, then all our wives are going to do the same thing to us. They have great marriages, by the way, that they have to worry about subjugating their wives. 
And so if they hear that the queen doesn't have to respect you and do what you say, they're going to do the same for us. And they're not going to do what I say. And I really like sandwiches at 2 p.m. I'm not going to get my sandwiches. What am I going to do without my pre-dinner Whopper? So he's like, you know what, you're right. What do we... What, what do we do? It's like, here's what you can do. You're going to put her away. You're going to just, she's no longer a queen. And literally says this, you're going to find a beautiful wife that will know her place. That's healthy. She'll know her place. And he's like, let's do it. That she gets put away. And all of a sudden they have an American Idol bachelor crossover and they get all the women together okay because they didn't have tinder back then they couldn't just swipe okay there's no bumble those of you don't know what it is that's fine you don't need to know talk to a 20 year old how about that so they get all these women together and Esther's one of those women mordecai who is she's an orphan by the way esther is and her uncle slash cousin, is raising her as her own, as his own. He says, you know what? Go. You're beautiful. Your name is Star. You're going to get in. You're going to make it. You're going places. But don't tell them you're a Jew. And that's nothing new. That still isn't anything new. I remember as a kid filling out college applications. Don't put Hispanic on the. Don't let them know. Just check Caucasian and call it a day. Okay. So then we cut to, it's her time. They're preparing these girls. They spend months preparing them, giving the best creams and lotions with big, you know, berries. And the guy that's preparing all these girls is like going, you know, hey, uh, I love her eyebrows, but there should be two of them. Uh, <laughs> stand up. Looks like you got a basketball, man. Do one of these. That's no good. And he gets to Esther and says, like, oh, I think this is the one. And, and like a, a regular realtor, he gets all the women he thinks uh, the king won't pick, and then she's picked last. It's interesting. That's what I think anyway. All the girls go before her, they go see the king, and then if they don't get selected, they go to this group of women for the king, but not the queen. Esther comes in, all she has is herself. She doesn't, she doesn't bring anything with her. She gets selected, and we're off and running. Esther lives in a weird time. The Israelites are not in Israel. Okay? The Jews are not in Israel. Uh, the Jewish kingdom, they're in exile. They've been taken prisoner. She's marrying a pagan, right? She's marrying a non-believer. She's got to hide her identity, who she is. She's pretty, but she's also Jewish. Well, just keep the pretty, drop the Jew. And this whole time, God's not doing nothing. He's not talking. There's no problem. And then Mordecai does something really cool. He finds out about an assassination attempt. He stops it, saves the king's life. They put it in the books and say, okay, we're going to get to that later, but right now we've got to figure out this Rubik's Cube. I'm just kidding. They didn't have Rubik's Cube. Then later on, uh, this guy gets brought to prominent, prominence, Haman. This whole thing's like a novella, if you, don't, if you haven't gotten it by now. It really is like a Spanish novella. And all of a sudden... You have the villain, Haman. Haman hates Mordecai because Mordecai doesn't respect him. And, I, and he gets to hate him so much, like, I don't just hate you. I hate your family. I hate your people. I hate your gums. I don't like you at all. He starts concocting ways for him to get back at him. And, and eventually, he's like, you know what? I'm not just going to exterminate him. I'm going to exterminate all the Jews. I don't even want to see him in my sight. 
because this guy got me mad and obviously if one person gets me angry all the rest obviously will so genocide i feel like i'm right so he does this he has the king sign the decree on this particular day you're gonna go and you can murder as many jewish people as you want and by the way you get to keep all their stuff uh, what yeah yeah kill them take their stuff it'll be fine it's fine and the way the decrees worked back then, it wasn't just like automatically you make a decree, then you can amend it. Once a decree was made, you couldn't change it. It was there for life, forever. The Jews are gonna, can be murdered on this day moving forward. So the, here's where we jump into the story. In Esther 4, verse 8. Mordecai and Esther are having to talk through, through a, a, an, an intermediary, a messenger, because they can't talk directly to each other. It says, he also gave him a copy. He, Mordecai, gave the messenger a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, the Jewish annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Up, at this, up until this point, nobody knows she's a Jew except for, well, now this messenger, Esther and Mordecai. We're all going to die. You need to do something about it. Open your mouth and, and stick up for your people. Her response is in verse 11 of chapter 4. All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. You know what? That sounds rough. I mean, I'm really sorry that all of our people are going to be murdered and slaughtered, but I'm really nervous and if I go to the king and he doesn't extend the, extend the scepter, I'm going to die. So thanks, but no thanks. Sorry. Bye. I can't help you. It's too scary. No thank you. You know what? I'm sorry for you guys out there. In here, I'm, I'm sorry. Mordecai, sensing what was going on, tells her, in verse 13, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Many of us get so caught up in the life that we're living that we lose sight of why God has given us these blessings. God doesn't bless, bless. I got a list for right second. God does not bless us so that we can keep it. God has not granted you that job or that car or your health or your family or those positions that you hold just for you. We live for a bigger purpose. We, live, we need a bigger purpose because anytime we live just in, in and for ourselves, we will eventually come to ethical, moral bankruptcy because eventually it's not enough. We need to live for something bigger than ourselves. And this whole time, Esther's only thinking about herself. Look, I'm the queen now, and he gave me this position because I know my place, and so I'm going I'm to go ahead and say no. And she forgets that maybe, just maybe, God has blessed her with that position in order to save her people. Just maybe. Maybe. Verse 13, he sent back his answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Verse 14, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. He recognizes that they are God's people. But you and your father's family will perish. That end of that is my favorite part. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Not one mention of God coming down from a tree, angels descending, none of that. Literally, God working in the background and doing something 
and orchestrating something, and all of a sudden it coming ahead, knowing full well Haman is going to be so angry with Mordecai because Mordecai is just doing and living the way I told him to. That he sets up Esther to be in this position. And Esther's still freaking out because she has... She doesn't have the courage. She was literally hired for this job because she knew her place. And it wasn't to tell the king what to do. But if we lose sight of connecting our blessing with God's purposes, we lose sight of ever being used by God. Our blessing, our position, and I say our, I'm as susceptible to this as anybody else. When we lose sight of why we receive these blessings, we lose sight, potentially for a long time, of God's purpose in our life. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. What is the point of God's blessing in our life? Do I have the house I have? Do I have the family I have? Do I have the job I have? Do I have the friends that I have? Do I have the interests that I have only for my own purposes, only for my own needs and desires? Or do I have those things because maybe, just maybe, one person or one instance, I could come in and be God's life and truth and justice and mercy and grace and gentleness and kindness Could I be that? Or is it just for me so that I could always know I can always afford a a double quarter pounder with cheese? Is the end all be all of my existence just to be the accumulation of stuff? And man, you know what? I bought the new best, brightest thing and now I'm happy. Why? Because I have the new best, brightest thing. Oh, didn't you hear last week the new thing came out? Oh no, I gotta get the new thing. What are we, and I say we, I'm in this with you, what are we doing to make sure that we remember that God's blessings, the blessings we have in our lives are not only intended for our own use, but for others. It's all over scripture. In Proverbs 11.25, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. If you forgive others, you yourself will be forgiven. Bless others and you will be blessed. It's all over Scripture, Old and New Testament. If you bless others, God will bless you. Again, not for you to be blessed, but for others, everybody. If it's the good news for us, it's the good news for everybody around us. It doesn't just apply to us in the singular, it's us in the plural. We have Esther trying to figure out what to do here. Because she was focused on what she might lose. What, what, what's going to happen if I do that? At some point we have to face a decision on whether we will allow God to use us in the position He has placed us in. And we get a choice. We've been put here for something bigger. If we lose the bigger, we lose our purpose. We Esther was not made a queen just for her own enjoyment so that she could have servants and everything she ever wanted. It was to save her people. That was the purpose of that. God working in the background the whole time through the mundane. And finally she gets it. Okay, you're right. I need to save my people. And then in Esther 4, 6, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. I'm going to do this because I've been built for a a bigger purpose, and I'm going to save my people. And even if I don't, I'm still going to stand up for them. This is my purpose. This is why I'm here. And she stands up. And as soon, the moment she connects with God, God does the plot twist. She, the king has insomnia. Can't sleep. What do you do when you can't sleep? Read something boring. He asks for uh, government documents to be read to him. And he gets to the point where Mordecai was um, uh, basically saved his life. 
Did we honor him? No, we didn't honor him. Oh, man, we got to honor him. Uh, hey, Haman, come here for a second. Uh, what should we do for the man that the king loves? Haman's like, oh, my gosh, he's talking about me. What has two thumbs and is about to be blessed? This guy. And he starts naming off all the things that he should be getting. All the things. He's like, you should give him a robe, and you should parade him around. It's going to be awesome, and you should, you should really do that soon for me. I mean for him. No, him. King's like, awesome, do that for Mordecai. Oh, no, not my mortal enemy. I just set up this whole thing to kill him and his entire people. And he starts freaking out. He goes through the process of that. And, he, and, he, and then he's freaking out. And then the next day, Esther rises up and says, you're trying to kill me and my people. And he really freaks out. He's like, oh, no. And the king freaks out. And he goes out of the room. And, 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 and Haman grabs Esther. He's like, please don't hurt me. And then the king walks in while he's grabbing her. He's like, what are you doing? I don't know what I'm doing. And he hangs in the gallow that he built and created to hang and kill Mordecai. God's people are saved. And the whole time, it was done without God audibly saying anything. The normal, the mundane. Do we view where we are as a platform to be used? Do we view what God has done for us as an opportunity to advance his kingdom? Are we looking for the pot, plot twist? Are we looking for the thing in our life that's like, oh my gosh, I didn't see that coming. I, 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 I was giving it God advice to do it this way, but he decided to do it this way. What does Isaiah 55 say? It says, uh, Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God has it figured out. And when we decide to live for his purpose, all of a sudden we see amazing things happen, and maybe even saving a people. A purpose greater than ourselves. A reason for why we are here. Because when Esther made the decision to link with God, God used insomnia to turn the situation around. We can find our purpose when we decide to start living for God and living for things beyond ourselves. It's a two-parter. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You should live for God and live for others. And when we choose to do that, that's when we will find our purpose. And it has nothing to do where we are at the time because God has placed us there. I've had four jobs since committing my life to Christ. I was a youth pastor full time. I was an education director helping people in school. And then I was a operations analyst helping Dish Network technicians get to their jobs quicker. And now I write code. You're trying to tell me that, oh yeah, that's totally God working in your life because I see it in those jobs. No. But I have a bigger purpose. And where I've been placed is where God has, has me to live out his truth, his light, his love, his mercy, his grace his patience, his gentleness. These are the things I desire for me and these are the things I desire for us when we choose to live beyond ourselves, choose to live for God and for others. And like Esther, being a crooked stick, only seeking self to turning and saying, no, I can't just do that. I got to live for others and saving a people. Saving a people. We can find our purpose when we decide to start living for God and living for things beyond ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I ask that uh, you would just do something amazing in our lives. Father, I pray that as we consider this story of Esther, that we remember, Lord God, that not you just used crooked sticks in the, in the past, but that you use crooked sticks like us today. So right now, I want to just give an opportunity for anybody. If, if you are, are like me, and even sometimes you need to reestablish that, God, I feel like I'm messing up, and I need you to do something in my life. If that's you, like it was for me, and like it continues to be for me, I would say, raise your hand. I'm raising mine. God, I need 
you to help me to see and to live beyond myself, to live beyond my circumstance and my situation, to see my purpose where I am, to use it as a platform for your honor and your glory. God, you see everybody who raised their hand. You see everybody in this place and everybody online. God, help us to live beyond ourselves. Help us to live in communion with you, linking up with you to see your purpose in our life. Lord, we thank you. We ask this in your name, Jesus. It's all stand.